listen, I love Critical Role as much as the next guy. Okay. Big fan of what they do. Sure. Big fan of what they do. But the sheer audacity that one Michael M. Mercer, I guess I know his name is Matthew. Mm -hmm. One Michael M. Mercer has to drop all of this Daggerheart stuff mere minutes before we start recording. Minutes. We barely had time to watch the 16-minute long video. We watched the 16-minute uh, intro video for the Daggerheart TCG system. And that's all we've done for Daggerheart. So we'll give some first impressions. Mm -hmm. And that'll be about all that we've got to give right now. I think next episode we'll have a bit more to say about Daggerheart once we're able to go through the documentation ourselves. Yeah. Um, but again, this isn't this isn't a Daggerheart podcast. Not yet. This is a D and D and MTG podcast, specifically the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast. A D and D and MTG podcast. Well, we're done to there. I'm Connor and I'm Sam, and we are the Dungeon Bros. But we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. That is true. That is true. Though, though our new friend Ivy did make a joke about us. Uh, not being in a dungeon, or possibly being in a dungeon and just masking it very well. She also wasn't in a dungeon at the time. No, so. no, she was in. She was in a lovely little office with a giant stack of TCG books, mm -hmm. or sorry, TTRPG TTR, books. Yeah, behind her. There's a lot of acronyms in this in this industry. You know, nerds love our acronyms. We really do. We really, really do. Um, but we're of course talking about the bonus action that we did with uh, Ivy, the CEO of the Crit Awards. I didn't say I. I specifically said we weren't going to bring up the bonus actions, but you know, it was a pretty good one. So yeah, check it out if you haven't. But of course, the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast yet again has been has been sponsored. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar, these are joke bits that we do. These are not real sponsorships. We make them up. Uh, but we are, of course, sponsored by a new company, a new initiative for uh, for Magic the Gathering called Skill Issue. Skill Issue, the new MTG service for those who can't seem to win their commander games. Raging about the counter spell that ruined your win con, Mark Rosewater will gingerly hold your face and whisper, Skill Issue. To make you feel better. Complaining that your friend is playing too many stacks pieces, well, Gavin Verhe will slap you across the face, pin you down to the ground, and tell you that you, too, also have a skill issue. All for the low, low price of buying all the stupid magic packs that, for some reason, don't have a regular number of cards in them. Each one will come with a little coupon code that you can yeah. use to get a 10% discount on skill issue. If you use code Dungeon Bros at checkout as well. That is, a, that is a fake ad. But, quit complaining when you just lose the game like me i complain all the time when you I do lose the game. you do i'm just a constant complainer so sam how, how the how the hell are you i'm alive that's good that's good you've got you've got some exciting things coming up this weekend yeah and this weekend i'm heading up to uh actually down we live north of this place we're heading down to georgia for a spartan trifecta okay. we do a lot of things down here in georgia got the We've got, we've got the production companies that make things like The Walking Dead mm. down here in Georgia. Georgia. Uh, also in Georgia, not the place that we go to for the Spartan, but the place we'll go to in a month for Tough Mudder Atlanta is where they shot the cabin scenes for uh, Tony Stark's cabin in um, Endgame. Hmm. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Are you going to that cabin? Uh, we can. It's it's usually about 100 feet off course. It's also where they shot the uh, Wakanda scenes for uh, Infinity War. Really? Yeah. Just a big open field down there. Yeah, I mean, like, I guess that makes sense. I guess that makes sense. I feel like that cabin was like an Airbnb that you could like stay in. Oh no! At least the uh, it's it's just out in the middle. I mean, maybe you can. It's just off of a horse eventing farm. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, don't know why you subject yourself to the whole running thing, but it's fun. I'm sure you think that. It's something to do. That is that, I believe. That is, it is definitely something to do. Um, have fun with that. I, I will, will be, I will be not doing that, actually. That what will you be, be doing instead? I think I've got, I think I've got, around. I think I've got like dinner plans on Saturday with, with the lady and her fam, I think. Don't quote me on that. Don't quote me on that. Otherwise, I'll be playing uh, a second playthrough of Persona 5 Royal, probably. Or I might actually finally go and uh, f 
play Final Fantasy VII Remake for the first time ever. Mm. Uh, because Rebirth came out, and apparently it's very, very good. I've heard that as well. Yeah, but uh, I'm not playing it because I never played the, the original remake. I like Final Fantasy VII. I played the original years ago on my PSP, back when that was still relevant. And I enjoyed I enjoyed Final Fantasy VII quite a bit, but I was excited for the remake. I just never got around to actually playing the game. Yeah. Even though I have PlayStation Plus, so it's free. Yeah, I was going to say it was... Uh available to you yeah but you've been playing it's downloaded onto my console (laughs) but you've been uh you've been hitting persona 3 reloaded pretty hard yes persona 3 reload finally completed that game 100 percented it platinum trophied it as far as persona games it's a very easy platinum as far as the persona series is just beating the story sort of idea beat the story max out all the social links um do all the quests Okay. Much. Yeah. You do you do those basic things, and then there's a couple like um, like you need to make X amount of money doing part time job stuff mm-hmm. in the game, which is like one of the main things that you do at night to get your social stats up. So it's a whole it's a whole thing. Very very good game. Very clean. Um, a lot of people are arguing that it's not the ultimate way to experience Persona Three because it doesn't have the female main character in it that the portable port did. Uh, but the portable port removed a lot of other quality of life things. So I, I think Reload is the way to play Persona 3. They're going to have DLC for the for the uh, the answer epilogue mm-hmm. that, that uh, Persona 3 Fest came out with on the PlayStation 2. Quit coughing. Quit quit clearing your throat. Thank you for hitting the mute button, though. That was, that was appreciated. Perfect. We're learning. We're learning, yes. We're learning. We're good podcasters. I see you mugged to the camera. I think it's... A good a time as any. <laughs> Segway into the fact that we are now. This is this is we're, we're we're trying out the video podcast for the first time. Hello, hi, hello, viewer at home. You can watch the video podcast on our YouTube channel. Of course, this podcast goes live every other week on YouTube, Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, all of the other podcast services around the globe. But the YouTube, the actual YouTube video version of the podcast, will have actual video now, as opposed to just a blank screen with the title card. Yeah. So that'll be that'll be neat. It'll make it easier to make shorts as well, you can which see, is exciting. You can see our beautiful faces. Well, you can see our faces, <laughs> our bearded faces. Our bearded. They are bearded. They are bearded. They are bearded. Um, but now that now that I've completed Persona Three Reload, I now have a hole in my heart. Mm-hmm. I wanted more. I wanted more Persona. I was in the Persona you, grind. You're mindset. tweaking for some Persona. Yeah, and I'm like, I've done everything in this game. Could I? Could I go and beat the secret boss? Yeah, but it's a very unfair boss. <laughs> it's one of the it's one of those bosses that it's like you have to fight me in a very specific way, and if you don't fight me in this very specific way, uh, I end the fight. Oh. It's literally one of those you can't reflect or absorb any of her abilities, and if you do, she changes her attack pattern and goes into a max damage unmissable attack because fuck you. Yeah, it's it's not nice. It's she has twenty thousand hit points. You need to get her, she has like three phases, you need to get her below 10,000, but you need to get her below 10,000 by baiting one of those responses so that she doesn't heal herself up to max. And then if you bait that, if you bait, like she has to hit you with a physical attack and you've got to reflect it back on her, which that damage then needs to get her below 10,000. So she skips her heal phase and then you have to have the ability that lets you survive from dropping to zero once Mm. and then you have to hit her with the special ability that does the max damage that you possibly can do of 9,999 in a single attack Um, otherwise it is a fucking massive pain which you might be thinking Sam that already sounds like a massive pain. Yeah, it does sound like a massive pain. And you're right. That's why I didn't beat her, because there wasn't a trophy associated with it. Oh, see, yeah, if there's no trophy, like <laughs> I was like I was like, there's no there's no reason here. I'll watch the cutscene that happens after on YouTube, and guess what? Didn't miss anything. <laughs> didn't miss anything neat or important there. But as I'm jonesing for uh Persona 3 more, um, I could go through a new game plus if I wanted to, but I decided I bought when I bought my PS5, I got Persona 5 Royal, the PS5 version, because I'm like, this is a brand new trophy list. I love Persona 5. If Mm -hmm. the time ever comes, if I'm feeling the the desire, I can go in and I can replay and I got all the trophies and I can do the whole thing. So I'm working on that now and and reliving one of one of my favorite gaming experiences of Persona 5 Royal. Um, More pertinent to this podcast, I'm I'm considering disassembling my O'Hare Axonel Burn Commander deck as Mono Red and moving a lot of those components, including O'Hare himself, into Judith, Carnage Connoisseur. Judith. Judith. No. Rakdos Burn. 
uh, with lifelink and death touch it added and then also some token generation but we'll see that is to be determined to be determined what have you been we've been playing so recently since uh, I was in the mood for some Fallout, because the Fallout decks came out this past weekend. That's true. I uh, was, was planning to do a little Commander Pod with some friends, but that didn't end up happening due to scheduling conflicts. However, I've been, been, been burning away at some, uh, some Fallout 4. But more importantly, more direct to this show, this podcast. Uh, I'm in a Star Wars D&D campaign. It's SW5E. It's a homebrewed system by uh, some very nice gentleman online who eventually handed it off to another um, company in last year. But at the very beginning, we started out and we had a mostly good, like, good aligned party. And one person decided to play a, an angsty, semi-evil character. Well, within the first four sessions, I'd say, uh, her character ended up murdering a child. Mm. Um, mm. Ah, yes, the classic child Moida. Yes, uh, and thus became known as Darth Child Stomp. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's so unnecessary. My friend who was playing that character didn't want to quit playing her, but also the rest of the party now had no way to align with her, you know? Mm. So what our, our DM ended up doing was saying, okay, We'll play. We'll continue to play our good characters. We'll have you introduce a new a new character, and we can do maybe like a little side adventure, like a little a little um, something else to do with with your character and with everybody else. We'll create a dark side character. Well, that eventually evolved into two basically full campaigns, and finally over the past couple of sessions, that that friend is now planning to move away in August. So we're like, oh, we need to wrap up both campaigns. Mm-hmm. And so of course, how does our DM do that? But uh, turning it. To, so that now the two parties are at odds with each other. That's fun. Before it was this party is just going and doing their own thing. This party's going and doing a bunch of like personal quests. Well, now one of the personal quests gave us one of the the um, oh what do you, what are the the tchotchkes that the other team needs? Ah, uh, yeah. And so yeah, now uh, we are we are playing 4D chess with ourselves as we bounce between campaigns each session going, okay, this is what we need to do to set up so that we can capture the good guys and get the thing that they have. Whereas the good guys are like, okay, how do we cleanse the thing without running into the evil people at the same time? Um, so that's what we... The, I feel like that's got to be that, that's got to be a challenge with metagaming. It is so very difficult to metagame. We keep having to go, okay, note, we have like three note takers at a six-person table. All right. Do we know this? Does this team know this fact? Okay, they do not. Does this team know this fact? Okay, they do. So can we use this? And then we turn the DM. Can we use this to infer we can? Okay, so we know. It's a lot of that. It's a lot of that. Well, having a good number of note takers definitely helps with that, because that sounds like a very problematic situation to find yourselves in. Oh, yeah. Um, And like I said, our friend is moving away in August. So we basically have, what? April, we have one more in March than April, May, June, July. So we have about five more months of maybe one or two sessions each month to try and get this all wrapped up. So it is coming to a head, which is very terrifying. That is, that is something. <laughs> that, is, that sounds awful from a DM perspective. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, fuck, all right, well, I well, guess we got to do this now. <laughs> the DM, our friend Salem, is quite devious. That is that is true. They are a, they are a devious devious person, known for chaos. I don't like playing commander with them. <laughs> They're great. I love them. Commander with them makes me very upset because it's a, it, it's the diff, it's the difference between ooh I want to create chaotic gameplay and I'm going to actively do what is not in my best interest. You know, part of the reason they do that is because it upsets you. I know. I'm aware. I'm aware. <laughs> And then they and then I always get like, what are you doing? And then later they're like, I'm sorry, did I really upset you? I'm like, no, but like, fuck, dude. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, let's get in. Let's get into the let's get into the actual things. We'll give you a rundown here of upcoming releases in a moment. But of course, you can get the Duels and Mando Dorks podcast every other week. We go live on TikTok to record it. We also record the video now. Uh, we record live on TikTok on Tuesdays at 12 noon Eastern time. We are now in daylight savings time, which makes me want to fucking murder our government. All of them. Every single one of them. The buildings, too. Yeah. Murder the buildings. Stab the buildings. Yep. 
I fucking hate daylight savings time so much. I thought we were. I thought we were finally. They finally passed one to get rid of it. But no, they keep. They keep like getting almost there, and then they're like, ah, we're so close. We're so close to the actual change. We'll wait until after. And it's like, well, now that we're in daylight savings time, we need to wait until we're out of daylight savings time. So that means we're gonna have to wait till the fucking fall, and nothing gets done over the holidays. I think Arizona just doesn't uh, doesn't pay attention to daylight savings time. Yeah, the government doesn't, but like every organization in Arizona does. It's a whole thing. The people I know from Arizona were basically, well, the citizens. I know I have a couple of friends from Arizona, and they were like, yeah, we just, this." when they moved to Ohio, they're like, yeah, this is fucking stupid. Yeah, it is stupid. We yeah. don't need daylight savings time. I lost an hour of sleep. I'm furious. I work, for those of you that don't know, I work at a television station, and my job starts at four in the morning, which means I need to wake up at three. So when the time change skips from two to three, furious. See, when I worked at a furious, when I worked a uh, service at late night, it was actually be- the fall one was the one I hated because it was like, oh, we got to three o'clock in the morning. We can close. No, it's two o'clock in the morning. We have another hour to be open. Yeah. Yeah. I like that one because I get an extra hour of sleep. But, you know, different strokes, different folks. Uh, one of them always pisses someone off. So, so let's get rid of it. Yeah, I yeah. agree. I agree. Right. Anyway, uh, 12 noon <laughs> Eastern time is when we record the podcast live on TikTok, and then you can catch it the following day on all of the podcast services around the globe, Wednesdays, 1230 every other week, noon, 1230 noon Eastern time. And if you're listening on one of those, please leave us a review and give us a, yes. uh, and, and write us a review. That really helps us out. Yes. The, the podcast services, the Apple, the Google, the Spotify, the YouTube music, very, very heavy, very heavily rely on the review process to help boost podcast discoverability on the platforms, which is already pretty terrible. So a five-star review and just being like, Hey, we love you guys. Or if, if you want to leave less than a five-star review, don't, that's not true. Just be honest. Yeah. Uh, you can also follow the Dungeon Bros, which is us, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter. We've got a Discord server that we don't really pay attention to. And Monday Night Magic live streams every Monday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we play Magic the Gathering one-on-one. Anyway, Sam, what are the upcoming releases for D&D All right, and well, Magic the Gathering? Upcoming May 21st, we have Vecna, Eve of Ruin. High-level adventure. Uh, up to level 20. Up to level 20 to wrap, out, to wrap up the 5E adventures. Uh, then, well, not really, because, but uh, <laughs> then on June 18th, we have the making of original D&D 1970-1976. Not a game piece, but... A nice coffee table book. A little, little, yeah, a little history. Uh, then on July 16th, we have Quest from the Infinite Staircase, which will be this year's compendium of adventures. Uh, coming up in September... 17th of this year we have the one D D player's handbook coming out yes, yes uh followed by the one D D dungeon master's guide on november 17th and the one D D monster manual will be out in april on sorry february 18th of next year yes that is that is a wide spread it is a wide berth i don't I'm not particularly fond of that when you look at the 5e the original 5e releases they're not that bad but it's also like Come on, guys. Yeah, <laughs> just, just mean, like put put two of them out, like with put them out within a month of each other. <laughs> you, you know, like I understand, like if you don't want to put the monster manual out right away, hypothetically, That's you fair. can just use the. I That's mean, fair. you should be able. These they're supposed to be compatible with all five E stuff anyway. But I digress. Anyway, on to Magic the Gathering. Uh, the Fallout decks are out now. The Universe is Beyond. They came out this past weekend, of, uh, April, uh, March eighth. Uh, next up, we have Outlaws of Thunder Junction. The pre-release for that will start on April 12th with the full release, release on the 19th. Uh, we did just get some uh, leaked information about what of uh, the Magic the Gathering Arena bundles, as well as a little bit of information on the Commander decks. Oh, really? So the top part was the uh, yeah the the, bu- the arenas. The arena bundles, like is. It's whatever they do. The they, it's ooh, get your character, get your fucking draft tokens, get your get your packs yeah order early obviously it's gonna have pre-release kits play boosters collector boosters all that kind of stuff bundles i love i love the the bundle art having the belt buckle yeah i find that very funny that's very cute but the commander decks yeah so we have the we have four commander decks of course um scroll up just a little bit we have the the quick draw which is going to be red and blue is a thr- sylph no Description: The thrill-seeking, knife-throwing Atine nomad Stella is at is an undisputed champion of dueling. Uh, so this deck is going to focus on playing multiple spells a turn and dueling your friends. I uh, don't know. If is dueling, dueling a new mechanic? I don't know. 
Because I know there's, I know there's committing a crime. Yeah, that's definitely which is like you and another player doing a thing. Um, I don't really understand the crime aspect of it quite yet. I think we it's haven't been explained. Got... Yeah, it's when you use when you target an opponent with a spell, a t- opponent or one of their permanents with a spell or ability. Ah, yes, yes, yes. You commit a crime. So interestingly enough, because I did see on Twitter the card. Um, it was from, I believe, Strixhaven, the the secret rendezvous, I believe, where you and target player each draw three cards. Yeah. Um, that's a crime. <laughs> <laughs> it's a crime of infidelity. Oh, oh, oh boy. Uh, next up, we have the Desert Bloom, which is in Naya. After fleeing his old life, Yuma finds new purpose, caring for infant cactus folk. Sure. Uh, so this one will be focused on discarding lands and then bringing them back. Yeah, that's just that's just some classic Naya bullshit, honestly. Yeah. Um, what was the oh, what was the big guy from Ravnica that you could discard a land to lightning bolt people? Borborygmos. Yeah, that guy. Yeah, that. I believe guy. that was Borborygmos enraged. Enraged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck that guy. I love him. <laughs> um, next we have Grand Larceny, which is in Saltai. Once a thief, always a thief. Team up with Gaunti and gain wealth of stolen goods and outshine your opponents. Uh, this focuses on stealing cards from your friends. Quote, unquote. Then defeat them with shiny spells you've stolen uh, in black, green, and blue. You know, it seems very treasure-focused as well. Gaunti's always been kind of a little, little treasure artifact synergy going on. But <laughs> that guy's going to be committing a lot of crimes. Yeah. Lots of, lots of crimes being committed there. Love some, well, it is grand larceny. Oh, God. And yeah. finally, we have Most Wanted in Mardu. Vampire Queen Olivia Voldaren failed to dominate Innistrad, but her new alliance on Thunder Junction may yet provide prove worthwhile. This is Crime Always Pays, uh, amassing treasure, and hire fierce outlaws to overpower your foes. New Mardu Vampire... Probably not going to be as good as uh, Edgar. It sounds like it's going to uh, most mar- most va- vampire sort of synergy or de- decks focus on the vampire synergy. This sounds like it's not going to necessarily focus on that. Yeah. Um, is outlaw going to be a creature type? That who knows. I'm kind of I'm, I'm intrigued by that. Kind of like how there's like shamans and monks shamans, and yeah, stuff. and wizards and advisors. Might as well might as well have a fucking outlaw. Whatever. Um. Of course, I'm always excited to see some Mardu vampire, some ma- vampires that fit into the Mardu colors, as I have a Mardu vampire deck. Not Edgar Markov, nope. but it's a fun time. Uh, yeah, Outlaws Thunder Junction. We'll, we'll get into more. We'll get into more of that when there's actually more information. <laughs> yep. uh, next up, Modern Horizons three pre-release will be June seventh, with the full release on June fourteenth. Assassin's Creed Universes Beyond will be July fifth. Bloomboro has a set pre-release for July 26th with the full release on August 2nd, and Duskmorn House of Horrors is set to come out in Q4 of this year. Yes. Uh, before we get into the Daggerheart, which I think is going to be the bulk of the discussion today, uh, there are some MTG things we want to go over. There's been a ban list update for Magic the Gathering. Uh, they seem to be doing these every quarter. Uh, this one is very light. Uh, pretty much nothing has changed except for two cards. Ponder. Yes, Ponder is unrestricted in Vintage. Vintage is going to be able to run four copies of Ponder. Good God, the format is broken, he said, <laughs> ironically. Uh, but in Modern, we have one single card that has been banned. That is the only card that has been banned. It is Violent Outburst. It is an instant speed cascade spell. It's one red-green. Uh, creatures you control get plus one, plus O, oh, and then you cascade as well. Uh, it has been banned specifically to depower the cascade strategies of uh, Crashing Footfalls and Living End decks. Crashing Footfalls and Living End are two cards that have no mana cost. Mm-hmm. You can only have you can suspend them or do an alternate casting cost, and that's it. So they're always you're always going to be able to cascade into them. Uh, the problem with Violent Outburst is that as cascade spells are, it's the only one that you can do at instant speed. Yeah. So instant speed cascading into a Crashing Footfalls to get a bunch of rhinos. Uh, has just been way too strong. It's kind of taken over modern mm-hmm. uh, ever since they kind of 
pulled back a lot of the Rakdos mid-range power in the last banning. Um, they don't want to completely remove the the Cascade me- mechanic um, or, and just kind of ruin those decks. So they're only taking out the instant speed one. There's plenty of Cascade cards that have similar casting costs, but it's basically limiting those decks to sorcery speed so that you can't instant speed violent outburst and then protect it with like a pact of negation mm-hmm. or a, a force of, I don't think force of will is this force of will legal in modern I do not know I don't know I don't play modern but uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting thing it's the only card that's been banned um, nothing's been unbanned shieldred's still around in standard <laughs> not that I'm upset about that. That, that I don't know how shieldred the apocalypse is not <laughs> banned in like everything she's such a pain in the ass hmm. but yes mtg bands pretty chill uh I, I don't see i don't see any problem with that personally i don't play modern so no no uh but they kind of those More vintage yeah the 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 cascade the cascading into crashing footfalls and living end decks have definitely kind of taken over a lot so that I mean it makes it makes perfect sense to get rid of one of their instant speed engines that allow them to do that uh Watsi is also this is this is the last magic thing. This has caused a little bit of controversy. Infinite tokens. We we all love infinite tokens. They're little dry erase tokens uh, that you can use for your whatever you use it in your Ivy deck quite a bit because she's copying a lot of spells onto her. Uh, infinite tokens, big product in the community. The community has really enjoyed it. Big fans of the product. Uh, Watsi has their own version now. They're partnering with Ultra Pro yeah. to create dry erase cards that have generic Magic the Gathering frames as well as a blank one. And people are very, very, very upset by that. Um, Infinite Tokens had a full comment on their Twitter, uh, basically just thanking the community, saying that they feel like the future is very uncertain, uh, but as all small businesses do, um, they're going to have to adjust. Um, they're hoping that local game stores don't drop them. They're going to try and offer some discounts and some deals, work on a little bit of a smaller margin, see if they can get rid of some of the high shipping costs, and just really wanted to thank everyone. And of course, people are exceptionally upset as people on Twitter are often known to be. Um, a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, why is Watsi trying to take out a small business? And it's like, that's not what they're trying to do. There's I, a market. I will say Infinite Tokens, while is probably the most notable, um, I mean, uh, the professor always likes to shout them out on Thalarian Community College. I know Elder Dragon Hijinks, I believe, also had her on at one point. Mm-hmm. Um, but like Dry Erase cards basically are not novel you can no, buy you can buy a huge all. pack of them on amazon yeah they're, I, they're I, very I, cheap very cheap um i mean quality is always going to be uh i will say i have the infinite tokens our friends have some from amazon mine erase better they they the color comes off easier they're a little higher quality they're all a little all, also a little more expensive yeah and i believe you get fewer of them yeah uh, the main the main thing with infinite tokens is they are magic the gathering card sizes mm-hmm. Um, and they have, they're better quality for dry erase, as you were saying. And they also have like the little notch in the corner so you can put the power and toughness and yeah. like, that's kind of it. But yeah. So, I mean, Watsi and, and ultra pro just always trying to find a place in the market to make more money. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure I'm, sh- I am, I would be shocked if the quality of the product is bad. Ultra pro is pretty good about having a baseline level of quality. Most of ultra pro stuff is not bad. No. Um, so I, I imagine the quality is going to be there. Uh, people are going to like having the official licensed product. Um, I I don't. I wouldn't begrudge anyone that's like I like that it has the color and the card frame. Sure. Like, whatever, dude. Yeah. Um, I don't think I don't think this is evil corporation being evil. Um, if you care about infinite tokens and you really like them and you want to support them, you can always continue to buy their product, and I'm sure they will. Greatly appreciate it. Talk to your local game store if you're if you feel so compelled. Just for safe sake, we're not sponsored by them, obviously. No, no, I would happily be sponsored by them, though. Love to. I would happily. Uh, we do have an affiliate link for the Proxy Forge, probably in the link in bio. Hopefully, by the time this podcast goes live. <laughs> but that's a whole other thing. Uh, let's finally, let's finally, we've been waffling on for long enough at this point. We're a half hour in. Let's actually talk about Daggerheart. Yeah. Um, we were going to talk about Daggerheart 
Uh, we, we knew that the open beta was going to start today. Uh, we didn't really know what our thoughts would be because we wouldn't know until today. And we also didn't know if the videos and the information was going to be public by the time we recorded. Fun fact, they are. They are, like an hour before we recorded. So this is a first impressions look. We're definitely not going into a deep dive of the mechanics. You can go to daggerheart.com to sign up for the open beta. It is open to everyone. Mm -hmm. They also have a beta survey that is available to you. Uh, all you got to do is put your email in and it starts to download and you've got a ton of you've got basically all the classes as PDFs a whole bunch of DM mater GM materials a bunch of player materials a quick start guide rule set the whole kit and caboodle have at it uh, Critical Role is also going to have a one shot in the is it tonight? Tonight yes is at 7pm Pacific Standard Time yes. and then I assume the VOD will be available on YouTube immediately after yes uh, of course if you're listening to the podcast on the podcast service that means it's already happened so you can yes. probably watch the VOD now uh, where they're going to have a, they're going to have a session zero character creation little mini stream and then a one shot campaign with the regular Critical Role cast it seems uh, which will be very cool but uh, we watched the basic overview video. It was about 16 minutes long, and there's a lot of interesting information here. And f before we get into the the meat and, and potatoes of this, mm -hmm. what is what is your general vibe that you're getting off of Daggerheart right now? I think that Daggerheart is going to offer a very good high fantasy, um, like heroic driven sort of thing as we'll see in a second a lot of the mechanics are focused around like well basically your character doing hardcore stuff um, when it comes to like fighting or going down you know it's not an end all be all sort of uh, system and I don't think it'll ever say replace like D&D &D. Mm -hmm. but I think it looks very interesting and is, is introducing and combining a lot of mechanics. I don't think we've seen a lot of systems do in the past. I agree. Um, it's definitely a story-driven campaign engine, mm -hmm. in my mind. Uh, the the entire concept of like stress values, hope and fear, um, hope points, fear points for the DM. There's a lot of interesting mechanics going on. And they all seem to be, let's take away the specifics of... Um, damage and combat and spells and move more towards uh, just kind of the general, getting the general idea of combat and wear and tear and actions mm -hmm. and focus more on the why yeah. of things as opposed to the what of things. Uh, which it, if you're into like a, a more of a dungeon delve -y style campaign where you're focusing a lot more on combat, maybe you've implemented gritty realism, uh, some of those more niche D and D mechanics. This might not appeal to you very much. Yeah. Um, but one of the one of the big differences here, which I'm still kind of I don't know how I feel about, is the move away from a D twenty based system to a two D twelve based system. Uh, so players are going to have a hope dice and a fear dice, which mm -hmm. are D12s. And pretty much all of your rolls, you're going to roll both of them and add them together with any modifiers. And you either succeed or fail a difficulty class, much like you would with a D20 check, an ability check in D&D. &D. Um, except you either can succeed with hope, succeed with fear, fail with hope, or fail with fear. And then that determines whether you succeed at what you're trying to accomplish fail at what you're trying to accomplish and then how good or bad that success and failure is. Yeah, it's kind of adding in almost a tiered system where a lot of uh, a lot of other uh, smaller RP TTRPGs will do uh, there's one called Quest for example, and Quest always has a d20 uh, and always says if you roll between a 1 and a 5, that's a bad failure. Between a 5 and a 10, that's a that's failure but not as bad. Yada yada yada, so on and so forth. Um, so that's kind of introducing this same thing, but also incorporating the DM setting their own difficulty class. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously if it's still very, very difficult, it's going to be a, okay, you still need to roll uh, a 20. Mm -hmm. But even if you roll a 20, you could do that badly. <laughs> yes. So succeed with fear means... Your f so you have your fear dice and your hope dice. They suggest them being different colors and mm -hmm. then determining them at the beginning. 
obviously it could be very easy. Here's the colorful one that's bright, mm -hmm. and then here's the black and, and dark and bloody one that's fear. And so you can roll anywhere between a 2 and a 24 on these dice. Um, if you roll, say, a, a, a 6 on your hope and a 5 on your fear, that is an 11 total, an 11 with hope. Mm -hmm. Which, if the difficulty class is ten, you succeed with hope. If you succeed, that means you get that means you accomplished what you were trying to do, and you get a, a hope token, which you can then use to help uh, buff party members or yourself for other future roles that you make with them. If you, if say those numbers are swapped, you have a six on fear and a five on hope. You still get an eleven with fear, so you still accomplish what you were trying to do, but there might be drawbacks or consequences, and the DM or the GM will get a fear token, mm -hmm. which is a resource that the GM can use to fuel their own roles, which I adore. Yeah. It, oftentimes, especially in the D and D, it kind of feels like, all right, uh, you know, we're going in, we've rolled this, and now there's just no give and take. It's either you fat you 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 pass or you fail. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this this these tokens that each side has can be like almost a, a a call and response or an in response thing like you do in in a lot of in a lot of more mm. card gamey things uh i will say that <clears throat> pardon me i had something and i lost it so let's let's uh let's so continue talking the the f <laughs> god damn it sam i'm sorry samuel yes samuel yes get some sleep not right now not right now oh, not okay. right now okay not right now all right he was about to lay his head down um the, the hope and fear token mechanic I'm a very big fan of. Mm -hmm. it, it rewards the player for rolling really well, uh, for accomplishing their task, and they did it with the good side, and now they get a resource that can help them, and you can also aid your party members in future roles. I also adore the idea of the DM getting a resource that then they can use yeah. to conflict with the players, and it's a, it's a resource that is only given to them from the players. So it's it's a nice way of like, oh, you did this thing, but it might come back to bite you in the future. I remember what I was going to say. Please. Which is, you have to, uh, uh, it was only briefly mentioned, but you have to spend a hope in order to help somebody with their role. Mm -hmm. um, which I do like that. Because oftentimes in D&D, &D, obviously it's just mechanically advantage, advantageous to be like, all right, somebody's investigating. I'll help them investigate. Whereas right, they get advantage. Yeah. Whereas with this, it's like, uh, it, it encourages you to one tell them how you're going to help, and two you spend that resource, uh, so it continues to drive the game without just always being at your most advantageous. Mm -hmm. There is also an advantage disadvantage mechanic built into the dice rolling, where you simply add a d6 uh, to the two d12 that you are rolling, and then you add the d6 result to the total. Uh, for advantage, and then you subtract the d6 total for disadvantage, and then the still the it doesn't change the specific value on the hope or the fear. So you're still still doing the result with hope or the result mm -hmm. with fear. It's just simply taking away from the total. Yeah. Of the of the result, um, that seems like that seems like a lot in terms of just basic gameplay. Uh, D and D very much simplified that as roll D twenty, add a number. Mm -hmm. Roll D twenty, add a number. Whereas this, you now need to keep track of two different dice. You need to add them together. Add any modifiers. Which dice rolled higher? Because you the a fifteen with hope and a fifteen with fear are two very different things now. Um, and then simply advantage or disadvantage being roll two, take the higher. Now it's you're adding another dice and you have to add that or subtract it. But it doesn't subtract from the specific dice. It subtracts only from the total. It doesn't affect. I think on paper it looks a lot like a lot. Mm -hmm. I think in, in gameplay it might end up being just very like I don't know, roll. Okay, that one was higher. So I math, 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 number with hope. Or the, that or the fear of dice higher. Math, 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 whatever with fear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I agree. I agree. But I also know that from a new player perspective, D and D is already fairly complex yes. as it is. Yes. And so a mechanic like this is going to be another barrier to entry. Um another another little barrier that I'm not particularly fond of, uh well, 
I don't know how I feel about it because there's parts of it that I like and then there's parts of it that I'm like, this just seems like you're adding layers of complexity for no real reason, is the hit point tracking mm -hmm. and damage. Um, they've separated armor, they've taken D&D &D armor class and effectively separated it into two things of evasion and then your armor. And evasion is like the number that uh, the GM or someone else has to roll to hit you. And then your armor is you are able to reduce the damage that is coming in. Yeah, the armor is now a resource you use yes. to save some damage. Yeah, so if you have leather armor and it's got an armor value of three and then three armor slots, three times you can reduce the damage by three. Mm -hmm. um, and you can use only one slot. You can use two slots to reduce it by six, all three of them to reduce it by nine. And the reason you would want to do specific things is because when you're taking nine damage coming at you. Yeah. You're not taking nine damage. Your character has damage thresholds. So there's three tiers, it seems, of minor damage, major damage, and severe damage. Uh, so your hit point pool is going to be boxes. Yeah. So you're going to have like six hit points. If your thresholds are, say, I think their example was four, nine, and 14. Yeah. So four is minor. If you take less than four damage, you simply no 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 hit points are reduced. Yes, you take a stress, yes. which is another resource. Layers of complexity. If you get if you're taking between four and nine, you lose one hit point. If you take between nine and fourteen, that's major damage. You take two hit points. If you take more than fourteen, then that's three. Mm -hmm. So say in the example that they used in the video, you've got a level one rogue, and those are their values: four, nine, fourteen for their thresholds. Um, if 15 damage is coming in at them and they have leather armor, they can use one of the armor slots to reduce the damage by three, making it 12. So they take only two points of damage as opposed to three total points of damage because it's major damage instead of severe damage. Now, mm -hmm. this is where I am in conflict a little bit with the mechanics because it seems like they're just adding levels of complexity that aren't necessary. Um, it seems like they wanted to have the stress value because you can get stress from things outside of combat. Yeah. And if you have, if you're full up on stress, if you get another stress, you take that as a point of damage, which I like. Yeah. I, I like that mechanic. And clearly the thresholds meet the, it seems to me the thresholds exist because they want a small pool of hit points to make taking a damage from stress more of a, of a downside yeah. Than it would be if you had a pool of 30 hit points taking one point of damage because you have a lot of stress means nothing to you. Right. If you have seven, one point of damage means a lot more to you. Mm -hmm. But then they also are like, well, we want to roll a lot of dice for big damage numbers, but we don't want to be able to do that much damage. So we need to create these thresholds that then determine how much damage you actually take. And it just seems like an unnecessary amount of complexity. I think that it maybe is an attempt to reduce the bookkeeping um because oftentimes in D, D you go okay um okay get hit now you take this much damage oh but that damage is reduced then like a turn later somebody's like oh wait i had resistance to that damage how much was that damage again and i think that uh, uh, and you know trying to backtrack whereas this i don't hate it we I think there a, the the idea of a barrier to entry versus just a mechanic is is always a is always a fuzzy line. Um, I think that this one, if it's somebody's first time learning a TTRPG, this will be just something they learn. Whereas, yeah, if you're coming from it from a different angle, like we are, um, it not not necessarily something that is innately obvious. Uh, again. This is just our first impressions because we haven't played it yet. <laughs> it's, it's it's just one of those things that it just, I don't I don't see I don't see the reasoning for why. Like I I get it. You want your stress to be more valuable. So if you take damage from stress, you want it to mean more. So why not just say if you take damage from stress at level 1, it's 5 points of to your hit points. And level two, it's seven. Well, level three, it's eight. This level also, five, it's ten. Like, you know? This, we also have, again, we haven't looked at the player characters, but maybe this also helps level set with, um, you know, 
taking big damage in groups, for example. Yeah. Like if the wizard, like, you know, oftentimes it's like, oh, the wizard casts fireball, uh, you know, to clear out a, a whole room of goblins and also happens to catch the fighter in the middle of it. Yeah, sure, they killed all the goblins, but they also took out the fighter. That could also be mechanically a way to reduce the 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 imp- show the different effects of this damage across different types of characters. That, and again, again, that's that's fine. It just it just seems like, and of course, we haven't played this game yet. We haven't taken a deep dive into it. These are first impressions. It just seems like a level of complexity for the sake of being different as opposed for actually enriching or improving or creating a certain type of play feel. It just seems like a level of complexity for the sake of complexity right now to me. And that I mean, that opinion might change when we get mm-hmm. a little bit more into it if we play test it, that kind of stuff. But certain things like D12, hope, fear, the hope point, the hope token and the fear tokens, those those sound mechanically different. They sound interesting. I feel like it makes the experience feel different. And I think in many ways it's going to enrich the experience. And it's also mm-hmm. going to detract a little bit because of added levels of complexity, which is fine. But with the hit point tracking, I don't I don't necessarily agree that it improves the experience any. It just makes the experience different with more levels to it. Yeah. That's... More barriers. And that that's just me. Um I, I will say I don't hate the idea. Again, I want to see it in practice. Agree. I mean, we can, we're we not going to make any final judgments here, obviously. But uh, let's make a final judgment right now. This game's going to be shit. No, yeah, garbage. Garbage. Absolutely, garbage. Absolutely garbage. terrible. Ter- terrible. Um, the, I'm a big fan of the armor versus evasion I separation. also really like this. I think that's a very, very fun. Having, all right, you increased your armor. Um I imagine that there's going to be the the play of all right your leather armor maybe it boosts your evasion by one and then it has an armor factor of three with three slots yeah so you can reduce damage by three three times but you have higher evasion whereas maybe you put on like plate metal armor Mm -hmm. and it reduces your evasion by one because it's clunky but it reduces incoming damage by this is an arbitrary number six yeah and you can do that four times instead of three um, so you can get more damage reduction out of it and you can go farther with damage reduction, but you're more likely to be hit mm-hmm. with it. And I think that trade off is interesting. It also lets you choose to not use the damage reduction if you don't need it. Yes. Um, so that I, it adds an interesting level there in terms of being hit and taking damage. I like it because it is also, if we're looking at D and D, for example, when it comes to weapons and armor in D and D, it's, you know, they're changing a little bit with uh, the one D&D, but they're very arbitrary choices most of the time. Oftentimes, like, okay, do you have enough strength to wear the armor? Then you should be wearing plate mail. Mm-hmm. You know, bully, uh, you know, bully to you, rogue, that you have stealth and I don't. Yeah. Um, where it feels like, again, we have, uh, I want to see the, the, the equipment choices Array. that they're going to offer yeah. us. And if it's something like you're talking about, where it's like, yeah, they, they all have trade-offs. I think that could be very interesting and make it very meaningful or Mm -hmm. mechanically meaningful to why you would choose one over the other. Absolutely. Absolutely. Also, I want to go back for a little bit to the the 2D12 rolling with hope and fear. Uh, We didn't mention two things. If you roll the same number on both of the dice, that is a critical success. That is a critical success regardless of what the total is. That means you succeed on it. You get a hope. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and you also have some other advantage. I think you get to uh, clear stress as well if I you think, critically yeah. succeed. Yes, which is also... I love that mechanic of rolling doubles. Yeah. Rolling doubles is always fun. So regardless of any modifiers, regardless of if you roll two, if it's one and one, you succeed. Yeah. Period. Techni- yeah. Technically, the worst roll you can have is a one. Mm-hmm. It's the lowest. But if you roll two ones, you just... Absolutely. You just blew up. That which, you, as I said earlier, you unshit your pants. You, exactly, exactly. So I think that mechanic is really, really fun. Uh, from the DM side, all of their rolls are still made with a D20 because it doesn't matter if they're doing hope and fear on their right. end. They just need the number. So D20 is still going to work. Uh, I would imagine that they would still want the DM to have critical success. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, they didn't get into that into the in the intro video. But I do love... The roll and doubles means you succeed and you get all of these extra benefits. Yeah. Um, 
there is there doesn't seem to be a critical failure associated with that as well, but there also isn't really an official critical failure with D and D. Rolling one is just the lowest it possibly can be, mm-hmm. uh, and I think we've talked on attacks. It's an auto fail. Yeah. On attacks, it's an auto fail. But that's we, the only thing. And there's also a bunch of homebrew about like the critical fails tables and stuff. Yeah, that I don't think we're particularly fond of. No, no. I, there are plenty of systems out there that say you know. As I mentioned earlier, like quest, if you know, if you roll a one, no matter what, there, that's a critical fail. Or in certain other uh, systems, it's on, on the other side. It's like, oh, if you roll the highest, you explode, and then you can't fail. There are other systems that do this in different ways and do have auto fails and auto successes. But as far as D and D goes, I don't. Yeah, I think the way that it's been set up, the way that maybe it's maybe we're just curmudgeonly mm-hmm. that that's the way we've learned, that's the way we've set up, and we don't aren't interesting in changing it at this point. Yeah, fair. Though they did introduce it, they did introduce that kind of concept in the early one D and D play test, and that mm-hmm. got a lot of pushback. Yeah, it did. Uh, but I will say the downside is clearly you c- is clearly the fear die. Yes, the Im- the implementation of the fear die and giving fear tokens, getting stress when you s- fail, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so the likelihood that you'll fail badly is more omnipresent as opposed to a critical fail idea. I think I think you have that backwards. You're you're not going to you're going to fail, but it's not going to be as bad. Well, but you, you're still you're going to have that omnipresent vibe. Yeah, if you have yeah. that, you can all you, every roll you technically have a chance to fail with fear mm-hmm. or opposed, succeed with fear or succeed with fear. So, yeah, it's always that trade-off, and I think it makes it a little more fluid. I agree. I agree. Uh, the next thing, we didn't write these notes down, but the short rest and the long yes, rest. These were very interesting. So when you short rest, you need at least an hour, and you can do two things, which is uh, you can heal a low number of hit points. You can remove a couple pieces of stress. Uh, you can mend your own armor or someone else's, mm-hmm. uh, and I believe gain a hope. Yeah, prepare. I think prepare, prepare and, and then gain gaining a hope, hope. Um, which is great because you can do the, these things for yourself and some of the things you can do for party members. So if you're in a if you're in a party and your fighter has been fucking annihilated, annihilated, they can spend their downtime to you to heal some of their hit points and get rid of some of their stresses, and then a party member who was kind of not didn't really have much happening to them can go over and repair the fighter's armor for them as well. Yeah. Uh, makes the short rest more valuable. The long rest also you can do those same options where it's full hit point heal, full armor mend, full stress, stress, removal. stress removal, all that kind of stuff. Get a hope. If you get multiple party members involved, you can each get two hope. Yep. And you can work towards a big project. Um but you can still only do two of those things. So it's still if you if your armors if you Low hit points, high stress, no hope left, um, armor's badly damaged. It's still going to take you a couple of days of rest to fully recover from yeah. that, uh, which I really like. And then you can use longer exp- uh, spans of downtime to work towards a major project, which is going to have a countdown mm-hmm. uh, with the um, with the DM that yeah. they're going to set. It's going to take this many um this many t- instances of working on the project to succeed on the project be that like uh build build uh some make a forge a new weapon forge a weapon or un- uh decipher a codex were some of the examples they decipher gave. a code i imagine you could even work toward bigger goals of like setting up an outpost right uh or or creating a more permanent uh settlement of some kind be it just like a tent settlement that then could later evolve. It's like, all right, we have a month of downtime. All right, now we can turn some of these buildings permanent. Now we can build for like, yeah, I'm that, sure that's another level of it. Also that countdown sort of thing where it's like, yeah, okay, you have to, yeah, you have to spend, all right, to forge a new weapon, maybe you have to spend four, four downtimes to forge a new weapon. Whereas, yeah, something like a tent, tent city might be like, okay, you need to spend 15 downtimes. To build, to build out like a fancy tent array with, uh, like a rudimentary border wall, mm-hmm. you know, a palisade wall, if you will, or literally just like you get in the class, the classic fantasy, like you got the logs that got like the points sticking out, yeah. you know, yeah. is that a palisade? That's a palisade. That is what a palisade is. Yeah. I never knew what that word. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's well, there you go. I know that from playing uh, Age of Empires two. Oh well, Age of Kings. <laughs> Fucking dork. <laughs> that was oh, I played so many hours of that game as a kid. Yeah, I like this rest mechanic. I, I'm a big fan of the resting as well. Um, there's some DM stuff that they didn't really get too deep into. Um, 
that make running the game. I, I like I like that it's simplified with the D twenty so that they don't have to worry about all that stuff and the action economy. Yeah, combat. combat is very is very unique. I think in any system that I've so far looked at. Yes. So it seems like there's they have they have what is called an action tracker, mm-hmm. which is just going to be an an open pad that is available, and it seems it. I can't tell if this is how all combat is going to be or if it's just combat that you anticipate is only going to go very quickly. Because they did mention, like, oh, if there's combat that's going to be, like, a couple turns as opposed to a longer drawn-out thing, you can use the action tracker Mm -hmm. where your players act. Yeah. And if every time they do an action with hope, action tracker gets put on. A point gets added to the action tracker. Point gets added to the action tracker. They fail or they do something with fear that the DM is able to respond and remove a number of things to have a number of units do a thing. Yeah. So basically, as as long as the the player characters are going, they're building up, uh, they're building up the resource for the DM to then act. They get to do everything they can until they're ba- until they do badly, basically. Mm-hmm. And then the DM doesn't have to take, or the GM doesn't have to take all all the actions that have been stored up on this card. Additionally, they can spend two of those actions to get it to gain a fear token Mm -hmm. which then they can use in the future outside of combat Mm -hmm. so they can choose all right this combat encounter is going to be kind of easy but i'm also banking more fear that Mm -hmm. i can then use to make challenges more difficult for them later yeah outside of combat i i'm a fan of that mechanic it seems a little bit weighted toward benefiting the player yeah in my mind because the enemies can't act until they fail to do something but then again, they're also going to be rolling hypothetically going to be rolling a lot, mm-hmm. and maybe this is a maybe this is a uh, a system that's going to rely more on minions and more on just mm-hmm. really beefy characters. That maybe gives a maybe this will give it a more boss combat like feel. Like, yeah, you got your turns. You did as much damage as you could. Now it's my turn. <laughs> now I'm also because I. I feel like they they were delineating that style of combat from a different style of combat by mentioning the brevity of it. Yeah, that was a the it was just a few lines. It was very hard to catch. Yeah, so of course a deeper dive will be able to get more into that. But um this brings to mind with me the idea I've seen a lot floating around. I saw it originally from Monkey DM. Okay, yeah. And of for D&D combat there's the player's turn, mm-hmm. and then there's the enemy's turn. Yeah. As opposed to there's this character, then there's this enemy, then there's this character, then there's this character, then there's this enemy. Mm-hmm. So it's like the players get to all act at the same time. They can do actions, bonus actions, movement in any order. Uh, reaction. So you can do bonus action things in response to someone else doing something. So if someone's like, I'm going to run over there, and it's like, oh, are you going to attack? Yeah. Okay. Well, then the bard can use their bonus action to bardic inspiration you before yeah. you attack. And, oh, you can still use reaction spells at reaction speed, and it kind of has to change how you do legendary actions a little bit, make yeah. more reaction abilities. But it's like the players get all of their stuff, and then the enemies get all of their stuff, and it makes tracking things a lot easier. It also lets characters collaborate and cooperate more effectively, um, which I think is a much more streamlined option for mm-hmm. D&D. And it... I kind of get that vibe from what they're trying to say with the action tracking part of it. But then you can, as the DM, it's like, oh, you did that with fear. Then I can interrupt that. And now I can do something. Yeah. Which adds another level to that, which I'm very, I'm, I'm into. I'm interesting. I'm interested to see how the balance of you've taken now five actions. I'm going to use four now. Yeah. And see how that goes. And it's like, oh, he banked two of them. Is he going to use that for fear? tokens that he can use later on to make things harder for us or is he going to spend all of them to make this battle harder for us yeah um i like that kind of dynamic there it kind of gives that it kind of gives a a a whole um actual arc to any sort of to the combat to the combat and the the encounter day yeah Um, absolutely it's a it's a new dynamic it's a fun twist on it um so that's pretty much all they talked about in there was one more thing that uh, we kind of we've kind of bounced around a little bit but the one uh, one last thing was the stress and fear and yes. how those are used so stress obviously like we said if you take damage less than your minimum damage threshold you instead get a stress but they mentioned that characters can also use stress in order to activate abilities certain mm-hmm. abilities mm-hmm. um which coming from D backgrounds there's a very 
it's not a game that has been implemented to say if you do this negative impact thing you get to do a bigger thing like one of the only ones in base 5e is the barbarians berserker berserker yeah, yeah. the 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 uh, if you attack with advantage then you get everybody else gets to attack at advantage with you and oh, if you the, the reckless attack reckless but also the berserkers if you go into this extra rage you get a level of exhaustion when you come out mm-hmm. not a lot of that so I'm, I'm if you if you go to the Dungeon Bros link in the bio, you can go to our uh, drive through RPG page where we have an entire homebrew supplement for five dollars of uh, Blood Magic and Hemocraft, which is all built around using hit dice to take damage and then do bigger and better things. Yeah, carry on. But uh, so <laughs> using these stress tokens to, um, you take stress in order to do bigger, better things. Again, that's another thing I'm hoping. I'm excited to look into for the character options of like, yeah, um, you know. Maybe there is a high stress build you can do where it's like, I'm going to take a lot of stress in order to do more, you know, to be a glass cannon or something like that. Yeah. I'm at, oh, yeah, the high stress build sounds like a, an archetype yeah. that could evolve from this. That's that's been interesting. I didn't think of that. And then the fear tokens, on the other hand, like we said, we don't, uh, you know, make it hard, make things harder, but uh, they said that the monsters or the baddies will also have abilities that the DM activates using fear. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Ooh, there's so many levels to that, and I love, I, the the fear hope, I was I was very skeptical of the two d twelve system when they said, oh, it's going to be a two d twelve system. Yes. Now actually seeing how it's playing out with the hope and the hope and the fear dice, getting the hope tokens that benefit you, and then giving the DM a resource that's going to benefit them, and having it be a finite resource. Yeah. So that the DM can't just like, oh, now they can do this, mm-hmm. uh, which kind of limits them a little bit. But also, it's one of those things that you can kind of bank a little bit, and the players know. So there's, like, this added level of tension at the table outside of the mechanics as well, which I find... Imagine just placing, like, a little clear container, like, oh, you you failed. Just add one right there. I That's exactly how I would do that. Yeah. You get the little glass vase... You can make it fancy and intricate, and then you can get, like, these fake little purple gems. And it's like, oh, with fear? Clink. (laughs) With fear? All right. Clink. And then you're just filling up kind of, like, Hogwarts house point style. Yeah. Like that vase. And then you're like, oh, okay, hold on. And then you grab it, and then you pull out a handful of them. And they're like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I that That's a fun visual that I would love. That'd be fun. I would love to do. But, again, um, any any last last words you want to say about your first impression of Daggerheart? Um, oh, our live ended. Oh, well. Um, did you want to talk about the dying mechanic or the, uh, the going down mechanic? Uh, I know that one annoyed you a little bit. Yeah. Uh, when you, when you reach zero hit points, you can, you can choose whether or not you want to go out in a blaze of glory, which is you guarantee that you're going to die, but you get a final action. That's going to be a critical success. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can choose to stave off death, but with consequences where you drop to zero, you can't do anything. And then you gain a scar, which removes one hope, hope, slot. hope slot that you can have. Uh, I like that you. they also cap the amount of stress and hope that you can acquire so that you're not just banking it forever. So yeah. it's incentivized to use it so that you can get more in the future. Uh, and then you can choose to risk it all, which is just you roll your hope and your fear dice, and whichever one's higher... If, you, if, you're, if your fear dice is higher, you're dead. Yeah. If your hope dice is higher... You gain a hit point and you can start doing things again. If you if you roll doubles, you basically are completely rejuvenated. That's the one that I have a problem with. Mm-hmm. Is the rolling doubles and like all your hit points are back, all your stress is gone. It's like that seems like a lot, uh, too much of a big benefit. Even though you are taking the risk, it's like all right, I can guarantee death, I can guarantee life, but with a consequence, or I can take a chance at life and immediately be fine. But or I would end up not fine and dead, or I'll be completely rejuvenated. And if, uh, it seems, I don't know. I think that's too much of a benefit. I think the risk at all is clearly the best option. Yeah, but that's just me. Uh, I think it's going to be very interesting. I like the two D twelve system. I want to. I want to play with hope and fear. Yeah, I think that's. I think that adds a nice level of of interactability between the players and the and the the GM. I agree. I agree. 
Um, moving on, uh, we're just going to kind of wrap up some things real quick. Uh, Altered TCG, we talked about it, about th- I believe, two podcasts ago. Altered TCG was on Kickstarter. Uh, the Kickstarter campaign ended, and who doggy did it succeed? T- uh, Altered TCG, for those of you that don't know, was uh, a Kickstarter where the whole shtick is it's a trading card game where... Uh, if you get a card, you can just get more copies of the card directly from them. They are open and easy to proxy. You can keep your digital catalog. You can get foil. You can order foils if you receive foil token cards. It's a whole... You can trade on lo- on lo- my online marketplace. Yeah, you can make it, it... It's very free and open, and they're not like, hey, you have to use our cards for it to be legal. It's like, just do whatever you want with the cards. Uh, it seems like some very interesting mechanics as well in the gameplay of... Instead of life, you're trying to reunite your deck's like uh, main character, and like the, their commander, effectively yeah. with their companion, and that's kind of how you track life a little bit. It's a little weird, but they reached a total of six million two hundred thirteen thousand three hundred five euros from uh, almost fifteen thousand backers. And that equates to about $7 million, making it the most successful uh, trading card game Kickstarter ever. Yeah. And one of the most successful Kickstarters ever, period. Uh, that's that. For those of you that are unaware, $7 million is like um, a lot of money. That is that is Legend of Vox Machina level success on Kickstarter. That is very, very massive. Uh, it was already a couple million by the time we talked about it last um, but yeah, that's really, really cool. Yeah. Congratulations to that team over there. Yes. And, uh, they're the release date is going to be August 26th of this year, I believe. Yes. Yeah, so we might be able to get some early access at Gen Con. If you happen to be there at the beginning of August, which will be pretty cool. Also, my apologies. I want to, I want to apologize real quick because, uh, there's one other critical role related thing that we needed. We yeah. need to, we need to talk about this. Um, Matthew M. Mercer. Matthew Mercer. The Critters. The Critters. Stand down. Calm down a little bit. Um, on the 1st of March, Matt Mercer went on to Twitter and put a couple videos up talking about how he is suffering from Great Depression. Not the Great Depression, but yeah. from a heavy amount of depression, and uh, and how the conflict going on in the Middle East right now between the Palestinian government and the Israeli government in the Gaza Strip uh, is weighing very heavily on him. It's a very heartfelt uh, two-minute video and then a follow-up two-minute video because Twitter doesn't let you do longer than two minutes unless you pay for it. Um or he talks about his depression and how he's trying to be this beacon of light for other people and how all of these conflicts are weighing very heavily on him and his family and friends. And he's going through a lot of personal loss in his in his personal life as well and talks about this great amount of depression that he is feeling. He then goes on to say one thing that really irks me and then the response to this on Twitter also very irked me of he feels like he didn't really have a point of authority to say anything about the conflict in Gaza which he doesn't Mm -hmm. nobody at Critical World does really and he felt like regardless of whatever he had to say it wouldn't be enough yeah and then you look at the response on Twitter when cr- the critical role found fa- where all this conflict is going on and people on Twitter are lambasting the organization of critical role for not saying anything about it. Um, they're going after the cast and crew for not saying anything. They're going after the critical role foundation for not saying anything. And then they do. And they say, yeah, we support the Palestinian people in Gaza. And they donated a lot of money through the Critical Role Foundation to charities that support them. Oh, that's not enough. Oh, it's too late. Oh, your silence has been deafening. Oh, how dare you? Everything's awful. Oh, Matt Mercer and Marisha take $15,000 of their own personal money to donate to these causes. Oh, well, that's too little too late. That's not enough. We're not okay with all this shit. 
the critter community on Twitter is a fucking disaster. They are not good people. Mm -hmm. The weird parasocial relationship that people are having with this. Yeah, they're yeah, they're a company. They're a corporation. But they're also a group of friends that is doing what they love and playing a fucking game. They don't owe you anything. They as individuals don't owe you an opinion. They as a company don't owe you a statement about a conflict that has nothing to do with them. Yeah. Sure, Campaign 3 drew some inspiration from the Middle East in terms of aesthetic. So? They don't owe they don't owe these people anything. And it's also delusional of these people to think that, oh, Matthew Mercer and Taliesin Jaffe and Liam O'Brien, all these people aren't exceptionally liberal and agree with your opinion that the Palestinians are the victims and want to support them. Of course they do. Of course they do. As an organization and a company, the fact that there are people demanding they make a statement, demanding that they donate money. And then when they do those things, it's not enough. Yeah. These people don't want people to agree with them. They don't want people to do what they deem is the right thing. They don't want them to donate. They don't want them to better themselves. They only want them to grovel at their feet and beg for forgiveness. And I am very ashamed of a lot of people that say that they're fans of Critical Role. I am... Uh, there are a lot of critters that need to look at themselves in the mirror a little bit for how they treat these people, for how they treat figures. Because they choose not to make a statement on something that is a controversial issue yeah. that a lot of people don't have an opinion on. Because newsflash, um, there's two things that can be true. It can be true that the Israeli people are separate from the Israeli government, that the Palestinian people are separate from the Palestinian government, and both of the governments suck, and all of the people are victims. All of that can be true. Yeah. The Palestinian government, uh, they, they went on a terroristic rampage and killed a bunch of people at a music festival promoting peace. And they also did a lot of more inappropriate things that I don't want to mention on the podcast because certain words I feel like could get you canceled. Is it true that the Israeli government has also been basically using all the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip as prisoners of war and bombing innocent people? Yeah. Both of these things can be true. You can say that both of these governments are evil. You can say that all of the people are victims. There isn't a good side and a bad side. Mm -hmm. So the fact that people are demanding organizations and friends and public figures to make statements, these people play fucking D and D online. Why does their opinion matter at all? And they know that <laughs> that's why they didn't say anything. And they felt strongly enough to donate money to a cause they believe in through their charitable organization. Is that not good enough? If that's not good enough, that's a problem for you. Mm -hmm. I'll get off my horse. Do you have anything? I don't. No. Okay. Well, I'm pit I am very pissed that Matt Mercer is opening himself up and talking about his depression and then there's a lot of there's a lot of comments of support and there's a lot of comments of people saying uh, that's not enough. For some people, it'll never be enough. It'll never be enough. And he even mentions how it's never going to be enough. And that's one of the things that's weighing on him. And that's why he isn't on Twitter. That's why he isn't online anymore. And it's also, it's a, it's a very unsatisfying thing where if you, you know, you could find enough. You know, some people might be like, okay, that's enough. It's not going to be enough for other people or the other side yeah. or whatever. And, and, and you know. Look, I, there's there's so many better uses of your outrage. There's so many better uses for it. Yeah. If you care that deeply, why don't you volunteer to help some of these charities? Why don't you donate some of your own money? Why don't you actually do something that'll help people as opposed to just spreading more vitriol and hate online for no reason? Just a thought. Just an idea. Feel free to take that and run with it, please. Anyway... 
Moving into the to the wrap to up. the wrap up of the podcast <laughs> to the wrap up. Alter TCG seven million dollars on Kickstarter. Yay, love that for them. Uh, Brandon Sanderson novels may be coming to the NTG universes beyond. You know a bit more about this than I do. Yeah, I read the article. Um, <laughs> uh, this is this comes from uh, Dextero. Not really sure about that website, but. Uh, basically, in this uh, article or in an interview recently, Brandon Sanderson uh, said that uh, Magic the Withers of the Coast of Magic the Gathering uh, did approach uh, him for some possible upcoming adaptations of uh, some of his works, some of his novelizations into Magic the Gathering universes beyond cards. Uh, there's no been there's been no announcement um, from Wizards of the Coast of anything like this. This was more more just a little teaser from Brando Sando in an interview recently. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, yeah, Brandon Sanderson working on uh, Mistborn and the Stormlight Archive yes. book series. Very very popular series. Very popular, and he helped finishing uh, Robert Jordan's uh, The Wheel of Time as well. Uh, those kinds of fantasy settings, I think, are much more appropriate for. Um, Magic the Gathering, Universes Beyond, kind of a la Middle Earth mm-hmm. and Tolkien and all that kind of stuff. Um, neat. We'll see. They'll probably just make more Marvel stuff. Yeah. Lastly, <laughs> Dungeons & Dragons Onslaught starter set. So we talked about Di- Dungeons & Dragons uh, uh, Onslaught way back uh, when it for was first announced and you even got to play test at uh, Gen Con two years ago. Yeah. Two, two years ago. It's also been out for like a year. Yeah, the game released in I believe February of last year, and they yeah, they 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 built this thing up. They're like, yeah, we're gonna have regular installations to keep up with tournament and game store gameplay, uh, and they were hyping it up for a long time. For those of you who don't know, Onslaught is a uh, tactical mini board game basically yeah it's it's kind of combining the vibe of a war game with tabletop rpgs so you can kind of just show up and play it uh you don't need to set up all of this stuff in advance uh it's got a board it's kind of like you're you've got your little party of like two and then your opponent has a little party of two and then there's uh, objectives on the board that you can do as well as combat with each other and the game runs its own enemies yes it has a it has like a little built-in automation system for uh controlling the enemy units that are kind of neutral to the both of you uh, but you can choose to fight them or each other mm-hmm. um in the playtest environment it was very fun i enjoyed it uh, i got a little playtest kit that i was able to take home and i showed it off on our tiktok and talked a little bit about it on the podcast back then um they haven't really done anything with it since I think they released one update or one expansion expansion. Uh, But you can now (laughs) you can you can you can now get a starter set tendrils of the lichen lord of the lichen lord. The tendrils of the lich starter set for D&D onslaught. It'll be in June uh, and it'll be one hundred dollars. So no one's going to buy that. (laughs) Uh, Wait for uh, the fall when it will probably be at Ollie for like 20. I say that with no hint of sarcasm or irony as well. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, that is about all that we have for this, the Lord's 62nd episode of the Duels of Man Dorks podcast. We end the podcast uh, usually, as we always do, with questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and our ideas from people in the audience. Uh, usually the TikTok live chat, but it seems like TikTok took down our live. Took TikTok, we, the, yeah, the live I'm, turned off. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of intrigued to see if that's an us thing or a them thing. I don't know. It'll probably be an us thing. You'll probably just be like, oh, yeah, we lost connection. Yeah, that or... Yeah. Oh, well. Uh, we usually we usually take questions uh, from the audience at this point. Um, obviously, we can't now. So instead, we will... I'll make up a question. Okay. Um, what, is you, what do you think of uh, the rogue class in Daggerheart? The rogue class in Daggerheart um, will combine the domains of... Um, I th- I, I, of one of two things... There are several mm-hmm. domains, and it'll combine two of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think that it will have a, you know, it's it will, you'll be able to have five domain abilities mm-hmm. uh, in mm-hmm. your player selection at any time. I think the, the, the rogue will offer you some very um, probably stealthy ones. It probably has the bone domain, I imagine. The bone dome? The bone dome, which, yeah. which is about um, stealth, I believe. Oh, I thought it would be about sex. That's the boning dome. Uh, oh, the, bo- the bone dom. The bone dom. Oh, damn. <laughs> um, is an Italian sausage in a hot dog bun a hot dog? 
Nah, hot dog's a specific thing. Hmm. So just like I, a bratwurst in a, in a hot dog bun is just still a bratwurst in a hot hmm. dog bun. What if you take bologna and you roll it really, really tight into a log and then put it in a hot dog bun? Is that a hot dog? Um, It's a bologna dog. What if you took an entire tube of bologna that's like that's like five like inches what the, in what diameter? they cut off the slices from? Yeah, just take that whole thing and then put it on a single bun. Mm, then you're a psychopath. Okay. Okay. Well, of course, uh, that is it. That was all we have for this episode of the Duels and Mandadorks podcast. You can get it every other week live on TikTok at noon when the TikTok live happens. You can catch the video podcast on YouTube. You can also get the podcast and podcast services around the globe, Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, etc. If any parting wisdom, I can subscribe. Also, yes. Uh, we that love was you. my parting wisdom. Okay. Well, we love you very much. We'll see you next time.